everybody. We're going to start with our next uh, presentation. And uh... hey, guys. Can we get some? Okay, thank you. We're going to start with our next presentation. Um, uh, David Brandes is going to give it, and he's going to talk to us about modeling or a graphic uplift. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so. I'm going to talk, uh, sort of give a workshop tutorial a little bit about how uh, you can use uh, MoveBank and Env data to, to annotate tracks with orographic uplift. Um, I'll also include a little bit of science in here and a little bit of research results. Um, first of all, you know, as both, you know, I had a small part in the development of this system with the MoveBank uh, derived variables, um, but I'm also a user of this kind of data and, and Seriously, my hat is off to Gil and Rolf and Roland and uh, Samaya, Sarah, the whole team, because this is really nice. I mean, compared to what we were doing a couple years ago, trying to gather all this data from various sources with questionable computing skills, this makes it so much easier for you uh, as a user. Um, so there's a, a number of collaborators on the, 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 the data that I'm going to show and, and the research that we're doing primarily with um, Golden Eagles in, in Eastern North America, but I've also been involved in some work with Griffin Vultures in Spain. Um, and really, NASA should be on here. I forgot to put the NASA logo because they're funding my presence here, so that's, that's great. Okay, um, so let's move forward here. Um, as you've heard from many speakers, we're, what we're, the goal here and what we're interested in is facilitating the how questions, sort of a mechanistic uh, understanding of, of these, all these wonderful tracks that uh, everybody is gathering, some of them at very high resolution, uh, and, and hopefully by being able to link those, annotate those with environmental variables, some from public sources and a few variables that we actually created as part of the project, which I'll be talking about. Um, that's really hopefully going to be a, a quantum leap forward in, in sort of creating real science with a lot of with this kind of data. Um, so we're interested in both the aerial environment and the terrestrial environment in terms of, of the atmosphere, uh, turbulence, uh, pressure, humidity, wind, uh, thermal lift. All these things are, can be critically important depending on what particular uh, species, bat, bird, uh, you're interested in. And then, of course, the terrestrial environment uh, for many species and, and for birds as well is going to, to link, have links to the, to the movement ecology, uh, vegetation, land cover. Um, and I'm going to focus on topography um, with, this, with this talk. And I'm actually, uh, by training, a hydrologist. And so I've been looking at topography forever for various reasons. Um, obviously, if you're interested in how the water moves on the landscape, topography is a huge driver. So, but I'm also interested in that linkage with, with uh, with movement of birds, particularly um, soaring species. Um, so when, when we look at a, at a shaded relief map uh, with some interesting um, topography there, obviously you see some, some, some sort of unique features. This is in Pennsylvania. We have these linear uh, ridge, uh, ridge and valley uh, features. We have a high plateau here, which is dissected by uh, river valleys. Down here at the bottom right, we have uh, sort of a wide valley. So presumably these things are important. These structures will in some way affect movement of, of animals and birds. And there's all sorts of questions that, that come to mind when you look at this sort of a picture and, and these different structures and how that might affect the, the movement patterns that we see. And so I've just listed uh, some of those here. How does the topographic structure affect the patterns? Do the movement patterns correspond with patterns of lift for, for the kinds of species that I'm interested in? Um, does the use, use, of, use of different mechanisms vary with topography, with time, season, day, hour, uh, experience? We saw from, from Rand's uh, talks already yesterday and today that certainly it does vary with experience, and that's consistent with, with what we see for golden eagles. Um, and then four and five are more interesting questions about whether we can, if we're far enough along in our knowledge, can we actually predict movement patterns based on things like modeled lift and topography and so forth. 
Uh, and five, the reason I put this in here and the, the, sort of the, the focus on wind energy is that, for one, this is what's driving some of the funding um, for the work that I'm involved in is a concern about um, as we build out the wind resource on these high uh, mountains and, and plateaus and things, um, there's a potential for, for uh, collisions with, with wildlife and so forth. So it would be great if we could predict these, these patterns at a fine enough scale that we can actually facilitate uh, siting of, of turbines. So there are lots and lots of questions that, that we can think of. OK, so in terms of lift, um, so Ran talked about this uh, yesterday with some nice little um, schematics. But uh, basically, um, soaring birds require their movements are subsidized by lift. They're they not going to be able to make these long distance migrations without utilizing the energy that's provided by the environment that they're moving in. And there are a variety of forms of lift. These are sort of the two primary ones that we're typically interested in. Um, Thermal uplift, we're calling W star is the terminology that we used in the uh, Borer paper 2012 where we combined golden eagle movements and turkey vulture movements. So thermal lift, as you saw some of the graphics yesterday, this can extend for thousands of meters. Sort of the classic uh, diagram shows this upward movement current, sort of column of air. These can be tilted by wind, obviously, as the griffin vultures show us. Um, but the thing about thermals is it's, these are very complicated. It's a dynamic phenomena. It's not easy to predict. Um, it's going to be a function of the radiation coming in, what the land surface is like, whether it's absorbing heat, transmitting heat, um, vegetation, moisture. All of these things combine to sort of help you determine where these thermals might form on the landscape. And it's, it's a very complicated thing. Stability of the boundary layer as well is, is going to be important. Um, orographic lift is, is not so complicated, though. It's a, it's a fairly small-scale phenomena vertically, a few hundreds of meters. Um, however, uh, spatially, there can be very structured patterns of lift depending on wind conditions and topography, right? So it's really this interaction of surface winds and slopes um, that, that can generate this orographic uh, lift along, along mountains. OK, so um, I just wanted to put this up here. Again, this is going back to the wind energy um, theme here. Uh, and this is a paper a couple years ago now calling for the development of new analytic and modeling tools to understand relationships between uh, movements of wildlife and environmental and topographic factors. So that's, again, that's a motivation for, for the kind of work that, that we're doing here. OK, so, so what could those tools look like? Um, there's a variety of, of things that have been done and can be done of different complexity. Okay? So there are some folks who have suggested that, well, what we need to do is build small-scale physical models, put them in wind tunnels, make measurements, and that will tell us what the environment is doing. Um, honestly, I don't think that's very practical. It's just not going to happen at the scales we're interested in, at the, you know, there's so many studies going on. I can't imagine everyone's got a wind tunnel in their garage to do this with. So I don't think that's really the direction we, we're going to be going here. Um, I guess the state of the art would be to do numerical simulations of the nonlinear Navier-Stokes fluid flow equations. This is complicated stuff, big computers, fast computers, uh, particularly when we're talking about on top of complex terrain. I mean, this in and of itself is a research question, let alone what the tracks are doing around this. So while some folks are taking this uh, approach, it's probably not the kind of thing that's easy to incorporate, say, into MV data, right? There are some simplified versions of that, uh, linearized Navier-Stokes models that have been used. And in fact, the wind energy uh, industry uses these when they're evaluating wind resource over a landscape. Um, unfortunately, again, they don't really work well when you have strong changes in slope and complex terrain. They make certain assumptions about the flow field that it's, it's fairly, it's sort of a continuum. It moves up the hills and down the hills, and it doesn't look at things like flow separation or wakes that occur behind 
uh, terrain obstacles. So it works nicely for certain kind of smooth topographies, um, but it's probably not widely applicable to our kinds of problems. So um, what, what I did is come up with something. It's really conceptually um, very simple. And it's really just, in a sense, a, a, a vector calculus kind of thing where we look at wind direction and slope and aspect of the terrain, and it's the interaction that generates a vertical component to the wind. Um, so just uh, this kind of explains the idea. Um, what's key is the, the, the interaction between the wind direction and the slope direction. So if those two are coincidental or line up, then we're going to have a strong upward component as that wind field hits the feature. Okay? If it's parallel to that feature, um, so this is shown here, if we have a, this is a chunk of little block of topography, again, from my home state of Pennsylvania. If we have a southwest wind, which is aligned with these features, it's not going to generate lift. But if the wind is from the southeast, in this case, or northwest, it aligns with the direction of slope, and that means there's going to be a strong upward component. Okay, so we want to be able to build that in into to the model. And then the second thing is clearly the, um, the slope angle itself, how steep the is, is going to play a role as well. Okay, so we're looking for areas with where the wind and the aspect of the terrain are lined up, and the terrain is steep. Those are the areas that are going to give us uh, strong orographic lift. Okay, so what we came up with is this. That's a very simple formula. Um, whoops, back. We have the wind uh, magnitude here, the sign of the slope angle and the cosine of the difference between the uh, terrain and the wind direction, okay? Now, this is only applicable to the upstream direction from wherever the terrain is and wherever the wind's blowing. Downstream of the terrain, basically you have downdrafts for the most part. You can get some eddies, turbulent eddies, on the downwind side of terrain, but we're going to basically ignore, ignore that and assume that, that this W0, okay, W being the vertical wind speed, um, is zero on the downwind side. So basically, if I have wind data and I have digital elevation model data, I can do this calculation. It's not difficult. Um, so in um, ENV data, we have two types of, of DEM data, the um, SRTM uh, 90, roughly 90 meter data, and the ASTER 30. That's a global data set, or both of them are. Um, for large-scale movements, uh, we've heard several times at this conference about the importance of scale matching, and that's, I'll, I'm going to repeat that. So the kind of data you might select sort of depends on what sort of phenomena you're looking at with your track, but either one is, is available. And here, uh, wind data, if you're in North America, we have the NCEP-NAR, roughly 32-kilometer scale, three-hour temporal scale, uh, the rest of, well, Globally, there is the European Center for Medium uh, Range Weather Forecast model, which is somewhat worse, both temporally and spatially. So if you're like, like Ron yesterday, looking at very high resolution one hertz tracks of circling vultures, maybe neither one of these is what you need, right? Because all you have is data on a block that's 32 kilometers or 75 kilometers at at those temporal scales. So you really have to think as a user about the product you're getting out of the system. Okay, just so visually, here's a, a quick example. This is some work in uh, the south of Spain. This map on the left is slope. I don't know why I picked red for the ocean. That was not a great choice. Maybe it should be black. But anyway, um, that's the ocean, that feature at the bottom. Aspect of the terrain is over there on the right. So basically, it's a combination of this field, that field, and some kind of wind speed, wind field on top of that that generates um, the output. And so here's an example. In that part of the world, the dominant winds are either east or west, very much so. It typically either blows east or west and not much in between. Yes? Oh. 
So the question is whether there's local wind data for, I'm not sure what area, with a better resolution. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, if there is, it's not in MoveBank. So, you know, if you're looking for other data, we're, we're, we're serving up the, the large-scale continental or global data. There may certainly be uh, better resolution data sets for certain parts, or you can model them, right, as you know. Um, so we're not serving up any of that regional scale data. So when you combine these, you get basically a picture like this. So this is for uh, east wind, and the color basically is shown along the bottom, and you can have, you can sort of map, E3 and Pesor are two, two wind farms, and so you can map out uplift, um, in this case, east wind direction on the landscape, right? And this is based on the Aster 30. Okay, so that was a little intro into sort of how we came up with this, with this method. This is one of the MoveBank derived um, variables. And now just a little of a tutorial, I guess, on how you might use that. Okay, so I'm going to repeat a little bit of what Somi showed in the previous hour. Basically, you need, you need to have a study and you need to upload your data to it in order to get anything out of this. Um, you go to the tracking data map, you go to studies, you add a new study. And this is basically you have to give it a name and you have to tell it approximately where it is. You give it a single lat long. Um, you can add information. Data sharing is something a lot of people are, are interested and curious about. There's a number of options there. You can set it so that you're the only person that can see the data or access the data. You can set it that everybody can see it and then you can set it that um, all your collaborators or a team of people can, can see and use the data. So it's, it's fairly flexible that way. Um, so you upload your data and, and it takes various formats. Basically, if you have a data in a CSV file in columns, it can, it can handle it. You, you have to kind of go through a procedure to tell it the format. For example, um, here, I, you know, different parts of the world, people have different ways of writing dates. So you have to be a little careful you know, if it's February 11th, it's not November the 2nd. So you need to be a little careful there. And with your timestamps, make sure that you're using GMT. I think most people are. Um, so you upload your data. I often will just take a quick look at it on the map. There's a, you can click on a button to view the data editor, and it gives you a map of all your data. It's a nice idea because, you know, if you're working in North Carolina and all your data plots in Mongolia, you probably missed the minus sign on your longitude or something like that. And it's worth checking that before you get too far with this. Okay, so um, for this kind of, of data, the orographic lift, you're going to go to the move bank derived variables here. Um, and you can select, well, I, I'm not talking really about thermal uplift, but you can select that. Um, you can select orographic lift. Um, there's four combinations of weather data and topography data that you can select. You can select them all if you want. But you might, so I picked, um, in this case, the Aster data and NAR. I guess I also picked SRTM and NAR. Um, and then over here, it tells you what variable. I always grab elevation. Because when we're looking at orographic and thermal lift, elevation is a, a really a key thing. Because if the birds are thousands of meters high, you know it's, they're not using orographic lift. Okay? Um, the U and, and V wind components uh, close to the surface at 10 meters. Um, are the other ones that I grabbed. There's lots of other stuff there, depending on your application that you might like to use. Um, in this case, I'm interested in looking at tracks of, of birds moving over topography. So, um, so many talked about, you, know, you, you send a request, it sends you an email. So you get back, and usually this is pretty quick. Uh, in my experience, you get back a readme file with all the metadata and who you should be citing and what the units are and all that stuff. And then you get back your original data set with a bunch of new columns, which are all the data that you asked for. And then all you have to do is make sense of it, right? So then you're, you're done, right? It's easy. Question? Very good question. No, you don't. But basically, the calculation is basically surface. And there are some methods 
You could estimate the re loss of orographic lift as the bird moves higher than the terrain. The, it's not something that's been well studied, unfortunately. There are some methods based on the linearized um, Navier-Stokes equations that look at that, that you could use. I would say probably 300 meters above terrain. It's, it's a pretty low, uh, low atmosphere or low altitude phenomena. Yeah, but it's, it's always something that's good to look at. Did I repeat the question? I don't think so. He asked about the altitude of the bird versus the altitude where we're calculating the orographic lift. It's a very good point. Okay, so I'm going to show a few examples here. Um, this is some of the data that was that Gil and I and, and a whole bunch of co-authors worked on on this uh, ecology letters paper a couple of years ago. This is a, a three fall tracks from a male uh, subadult male golden eagle. Um, this is a bird that was caught in a leg hold trap in West Virginia, rehabbed and released, lived for three or four years, and then caught in another leg hold trap in Quebec and did not make it that time. Um, it's approximately hour, some three hour data, but approximately hourly data. And before creating this map, and this map somebody asked earlier about visualizations. This is, there's this thing on the web called GPS visualizer that's easy to use, it's kind of handy. You can color tracks with it. So that's what this is. Um, I filtered for points that were showed migration or speeds of greater than 10 kilometers per hour before I uploaded it. And it's really important. If you just throw all your data up there and grab all the environmental data and try to make correlations, you're probably going to wind up with mush. Okay, you really have to segregate, segment your tracks and try to figure out roosting, sort of local movements, long distance migration movements, and all of that seasonally probably as well to make sense of these with this environmental data. Um, okay, so, so this is what the raw data, it's just a CSV file, 41 is the bird year, the date, time, stamp, lat long coordinates in this case. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy to, to do this. Um, and so what comes back is some, a table of, and this is, I just made Excel tables. I think I've rearranged some things because when it comes back from MoveBank, it's seems to be it's in an illogical order at times. I'll have to tell Rolf about that. Um, but anyway, so here's the, the columns of the data, uh, the, the, the elevation of the ground surface, uh, UNV wind components. So I don't think in UNV wind components, I think in wind speed and wind direction. So I always do a little calculation to figure out, you know, this is, there's southerly winds there, and down here it switched so there may have been a frontal passage in there, and so it switched over to northwest. I tend to think in those kinds of terms. So you get back data like this. Uh, so I, I just created a, a plot here of the, each, the, the, the day is on the x-axis, or actually just the, the hour the data point is on the x-axis. Up here we have a plot in the red of the thermal uplift, the blue of the orographic uplift, and keep in mind this thermal uplift is some kind of number calculated over this big, 32 kilometer box, so maybe it means something about the, the mean or some kind of uh, measure of the average over that box. The orographic lift is calculated at a much higher resolution spatially with the wind data that the winds don't tend to change that rapidly in time. So what you see is that, and this we've verified with other data, is that the birds are primarily using thermal lift, but they're very good at grabbing or a graphic lift when it's available, okay? So they can, they're pretty flexible in using both. And if you look at these peaks in orographic lift, it lines up pretty well with peaks in wind speed. And often um, when the wind is, is from the west or, or northwest, if you look at these events, there, 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 not this time, there, there. And that's pretty um, consistent with experience. When we, we see these, Birds moving on the ridges is when there's high wind speeds, and that's typically post-frontal passage. This, this is in our region of the world. So that's, that's nice to see. Um, here's a, a quick map of the orographic lift. Again, this summarizes what I just said. There's uh, primarily, the bird seems to be using thermal lift, but again, I, you know, I question, 
the spatial detail of that versus the track. Um, there are places where it's clearly picking up in the region valley of Pennsylvania, Adirondacks and so forth. It is picking up orographic lift as well. Question. That one? Yeah, but there are occasions when there are both strokes. And for me, it doesn't really make sense because when the wind speed is very high, ships break up the surface. So I'm not sure that this question that you correctly characterized has a correct measurement. Yeah, there's, there's two cases there where I, I see what you're talking about here and there. Right? So if the wind speed's high enough, I guess we'd have to come down here and look at some of these wind speeds, like there, for example, that tends to break up thermals. So yeah, um, again, I think that may come back to this question of, you know, thermals are a, are a relatively small scale phenomena, and we're talking about calculating sort of some kind of average over 32 kilometers. So I'm not very confident in, in that, honestly. I think the orographic lift is, is more, um, it's more reliable, actually. Good question. I didn't point out that I generated these results over the last few weeks for this talk. They're really just examples, right? This is a few day segment of a much larger migration. So I think you're correct that the, the orographic lift that they use um, opportunistically is, is actually pretty rare. And it, I, Keith will correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of our early knowledge of, of Migration comes from sitting on these ridge tops observing what we can see. And what we see is birds using orographic lift a lot. And so I think the reality is when, you started, when we started looking at tracks, and this is very true for golden eagles, is that they mostly use thermal lift. And it's only specific times and places that they're really doing much with orographic lift. So I think that, that's a very good point. And it, that was really an example of sort of the leap forward with this kind of data from sort of a, a conventional understanding of, of what we thought we knew about migration. OK, I need to move along. Um, so um, this ties in directly with some things that have been said earlier in the conference. Actually, see the difference between birds using thermal and orographic lift. We really need to use higher frequency units. We really are sort of out on, on a, a small limb when we're using this coarser scale data to get at this mechanistic information. So um, this is data um, from the transmitters, the cell track uh, tech uh, GSM transmitters. Um, this was a paper published in Biology Letters where we can actually look at these tracks. These are, um, I believe these are 30 second data here. A bird f following a ridge at low altitude, okay? A bird going downwind at very high altitude, probably uh, in a thermal street of some kind, okay? And then another track here where a bird's crossing a valley, uh, gaining altitude and gliding, and this is this track here. So with the more frequent data, we, we have a much better sense of actually what these birds are doing. And, and this, this difference in altitude, I think, is really key. This thing's losing power. Um, as I said before, if we're interested in wind energy, what we're interested in, even though this orographic, use of orographic lift is rare, that's when we think the risk, the high risk events occur. And there's some observational data to, to, to corroborate that. So um, I'm going to look quickly, because time is short, at a couple of GSM tracks here. Again, this is a portion of a track. It's only for illustrative purposes. I don't think we want to go too much into, you know, statistical valid validity and these kinds of things. But, but when you look at a track like this, um, it's three hours. It's a, a late April track flying over Penn State University in the middle of Pennsylvania. Why is this bird apparently not affected by terrain, right? It's just kind of drifting north. 
Um, what are the atmospheric conditions for this trick? And how high is this bird are all important questions. And there's probably other interesting questions. So I annotated this data. Um, again, I circled this in red and wrote this time, 32 kilometer, three hour. This is a mismatch to our track data. All we can say from that is it looks like this time period is probably a pretty good one for thermal lift. That's about all I would go. Because they're calculating at every minute a different thermal lift value. Okay, that's just because of interpolation between two timestamps. It's really not telling us much about where thermals are and so forth. Um, orographic lift is very weak. Um, you can look at the, this is AG above ground surface, so the altitude of the unit, subtract off the altitude of the ground that you get from Aster, and you can see the bird is gaining altitude there. There's definitely a glide here. Okay, so it appears to be thermaling and, and gliding. And wind conditions, um, very light out of the northwest. Okay, so when wind is that light, you really aren't going to get any orographic lift to speak of. And just looking at, at, at these quick maps, um, we can see places where the bird is, is gaining altitude. These are apparently picking up thermals. This is obviously not as good as one second data, but it's a, a big step forward from this hourly or three hourly data that I showed before. Um, and over here is the above ground surface data. These are, these are very high altitudes uh, above where they could be using orographic lift. So, pretty clearly points to a bird that's thermaling north in late April when there are very strong thermals generally. Okay, so this has come up. What about sampling the environment around the track? Um, the road not taken is the term that, that Gil used. Um, there's different, so we talked about you can, if you talk to Rolf, you can, there's a way you can get from MoveBank a box or, or region that you can annotate. And that's what we did in the paper uh, with the turkey vultures and, and uh, golden eagle comparison. The other thing you can do is create uh, directed or correlated directed random walks through the region of your tracks and look at uh, the environmental variables on those versus the actual track. There are ways to do that fairly easily uh, in GIS. Although I think when I went to try Hoth's tools the other day, it's now been bought by somebody else. It's still there, but it's somebody else who's running it now. But you can find it. Um, so here's, again, five tracks. Not enough, but this is only for, to illustrate the idea. Five uh, correlated or directed, ran uh, they're directed random walks um, from this point here going north. And so we can look at, uh, just quickly, histogram of terrain elevation. I didn't bother with the histogram of thermal lift because I don't believe it anyway. But here's a histogram of terrain elevation. It's quite close. The background is, is, is uh, the five tracks or the dashed red line. Fairly close in terms of terrain elevation selection and very close in terms of orographic lift selection. Not surprising because there's very little orographic lift. Okay, so we can make some pretty strong conclusions if you have the right data. Uh, here's another track segment. Now this uh, looks basically the polar opposite of the one I just showed you. Right? This is a November migrating bird. Um, again, it's a, only a portion of a track. Um, the bird is, is following uh, a ridge line here, getting to a point which it decides, I don't know what it's deciding, but anyway, it drifts off the ridge. This way, kind of downwind possibly, it picks up this ridge and, and continues moving. Okay, So we can annotate that and see what that shows. Um, Let's see, I started a few things. Here's the orographic lift. These are anything above a meter per second is definitely usable by a golden eagle. So some of these are fairly strong. This is just the top part of the first 20 or 30 values from the table. Look at the, the above ground surface elevations are quite low. Wind is uh, out of the west, northwest, and that's roughly 15. We still think in miles per hour over on this side of the pond, and so that's about 15 miles per hour. That's a fairly windy day, right? Um, so here's a, a map of colors showing the uplift along the track, and I put the wind on there as well. Um, so the bird's moving along. There's a red point here I'm not quite sure about, but it gets to here and you see a couple of red points in a row. So that could explain why that's where this bird decided to drift off the ridge 
Uh, and you see it's quartering against, uh, it's not going directly downwind, it's kind of quartering the wind, which makes sense. It cuts to this ridge here, and it, again, it finds some nice lift, and then it, it's moving down, down here. Uh, here are the altitudes, consistent with, with what we're looking at for orographic lift here. Here's that, that drifting segment. It is actually, must have found something here because it, it gained altitude here, but then it, it, it's gliding apparently again and picking up the ridge. Uh, so similar idea here. We look at the histogram of terrain elevation along the track and it's clearly selecting, I mean this, some of this stuff is kind of obvious when you look. It's always good to look at the data first. What is it telling you? It's selecting for higher elevations, and it's definitely selecting high values of, of orographic lift. So it's migrating totally different strategy, different mechanisms than the other bird that we saw. Um, and one of the neat things about when birds are using orographic lift that we've seen is that their movements are fairly stereotyped. I'm not saying they're machines, but they're, we've noticed this both observationally and with track data. These are two birds separated. Again, these are GSM tracks um, from, from Mike and Trish Miller and Todd Katzner and others. These are two birds um, that are separated by almost a month in time, but moving on very similar wind conditions. And those tracks, like I didn't make this up, but they're almost on top of each other in the way that these birds, particularly here where the bird is leaving the end of this ridge, crossing to this one and continuing. I mean, to me, that's uncanny. That suggests that if we've got a good enough mechanistic model, we can, we can uh, um, simulate these movements. And I put this picture up there because our golden eagles hang out in the woods which is strange, because they don't do that most places. Okay, here's a nifty um, graphic that I was just thinking about the other day. So the promise of environmental tracking and environmental data, it says the knowledge of migration is increasing upward. This is perfect knowledge up here. And if we have enough tracks, see our, my model, so we start with a little bit of information, some of it crap, like I said, because we learned it by watching from a ridgetop. We start with a little bit, and gradually over time it increases and it asymptotically approaches perfect knowledge. And that's when we get to infinity tracks with 0.01 hertz, and we have environmental data resolution of 10 meters and one minute temporal resolution. Of course, we need heart monitors and lots of other things too. Okay, but so this is a model. Uh, but then when you look at data, and Trish just showed me this data yesterday, this is a juvenile fem female golden eagle that, that uh, they trapped right in here. Is that right, Trish? A little farther south, Alabama. So it looped around through the, these two states where golden eagles aren't really supposed to be. Um, you know, it's checked in at uh, Birmingham there. And then it decided, finally it decided to go north fairly uh, determinedly. Got to Chicago and said, forget it, and went back down. and said hi to, to uh, Gill in Columbus, got to Cleveland, forget it, back down, and finally decided that, okay, I'm gonna go up here. That's kind of where I'm supposed to go, right? Now this is a juvenile eagle, and they don't know what they're doing, so okay. I'm never gonna try to model that, right? But then we have tracks like this, which Trish also just showed me, a bird that was um, trapped in here in northern Alabama. Uh, this is a fourth year male. They know what they're doing, what they do when you let them go in Alabama in the spring as they go up the Appalachian chain through Pennsylvania and, and they cross at Montreal and they go up there. Not this guy, right? This guy decided that he was going to go north and then west and over to the Ozarks in Missouri and they didn't like Illinois, went straight across that, went to Chicago like the other bird, got lost in the thumb of Michigan and seems to now kind of have figured out where uh, it's going. So, so my revised model looks more like this. The knowledge of migration versus the number of tracks. It's, it is an increasing function, but it's not monotonic. And um, it has these big drops. That's like when you find out that a migratory bird is, doesn't migrate anymore, just stays up at the gas bay. And there are places where it actually goes backwards because um, you have to throw out some tracks because they're no good. I mean, it is going up. Right, but it's not quite 
the model that I had sort of my null model, which was this one. Okay? So when you look at a lot of individuals, you get a lot of crazy things, and you, there's always outliers and exceptions, right? Um, I'll go quickly through this. Um, so this model has kind of gotten some legs uh, in the wind energy application. By this model, I mean, I mean this way of estimating. It's really an estimate or a graphic lip. Um, just some quotes from the recent literature about the, the importance of this low altitude flight or a graphic lift, this interaction of topography and wind seeming to be really critical in understanding uh, risk factors around turbines. So um, very quickly, um, this is some work, a really nice field study that was done in Tarifa in southern Spain where a lot of birds cross to Africa in the fall and come back in the spring. Um, there's a lot of griffin vulture fatalities there. There are two wind farms that were studied, and there's lots of fatalities at one and very few at the other. And they were asked, sort of trying to understand why. And they also found out through observational studies that a lot of the birds, the collisions or the near collisions were occurring with low wind speed. And when the birds were circling in the vicinity of the turbine trying to, to gain lift. And so what we did is some mapping of, of uh, uplift. And again, for a, for a bird like a griffin, which has high uh, wing loading, uh, one meter per second is probably a, a, a threshold or near threshold value. So as this is wind from the east, as we increase the wind speed, um, so you see the red dots there, um, we start to get, we, if you go back here, E3 has a lot of lift around it. Um, here, KSOR does not. As we increase the wind, that picture changes a little. You get more uh, lift around this wind farm here. And so this is just, let's see, this is simulated uplift uh, for the four closest pixels in the windward direction. I don't know what happened here. It's east, it's a low, it's east wind. I forget, the, I think it was about six meters per second. And we see these near threshold values here and here. Uh, there's some up here, but there's also lift nearby. Um, and it turns out that some of the, a lot of the fatalities, uh, now this is 1990s data, so some of this, there's been repowering of this wind farm. It doesn't have the same configuration anymore. But the data set is still quite good. Um, fatalities occurred here and here, and this is areas where at low wind speed from the east, we see these near threshold lift values. So there is some correspondence with the field data there. OK, another example. This is in Southern California where I was asked to, you know, let's map these up, up graphs and try to understand why we're getting fatalities in certain places and not others. Um, this is very hard to see. I apologize. The dominant wind, this is the wind rose for that region. The dominant wind is from the west. There's some components from northwest and southwest as well. Uh, but again, this is a map of, of the thermal, uh, or not th I'm sorry, the orographic lift. There's a group of turbines on this side where most of the fatalities are occurring, away from where you see as I increase the wind speed. I'm sorry about the, the uh, contrast is not good on this image, but there's a lot more lift over here. In this area, there's these isolated little pockets of suboptimal lift, and that seems to be where um, a lot of the fatalities are are clustered at this particular site. So there might be something to this idea of being able to map these orographic updrafts and understand something about risk of collision risk at these wind farms. OK, real quick, um, I would say, I mean, this, for a user, this is fantastic. It's really cut our time involved in accessing these data sets. There are a few variables that are derived, like, like the ones that I've showed you, that you can't find anywhere else. Um, just a few words of caution, you really have to be think carefully about the, the phenomena that you're observe, trying to observe with your tracks and the data that's available and try to match the scales. Uh, you, you really need high resolution data to, to answer the how questions, at least the ones that, that are operating at, at small scales. Um, let's see, model or graphic lift can explain. Some migration tracks for soaring birds, um, thermal lift is, is much more complicated and I think um, the product that we have out has to be used with a lot of care. 
And then this is what I was just talking about. This orographic lift modeling shows promise in understanding risk of collisions at, at wind farms for soaring birds. Thank you. And thank you to everybody at, on the team for creating this product. Um, you know, I'm sort of, I guess I'm tooting the horn of the team here. Um, but it, it really promises a lot for users. Um, you know, it's up to you to be able to make sense of the data and use the data appropriately. But it's, I think it's a fantastic product. Are there questions? Yeah. In the, in the wind industry, is there a particular type of wind as far as orientation? Or the, I'm just wondering as far as the types of wind that they're relying on when they locate wind It's not as much, in certain areas, it's very topographically influenced. Like in areas where the wind resource is kind of marginal, then it's very important that these that they get sighted on tops of the, the highest elevations because the higher winds are there. But many parts of the world, it's really it's much more of a large scale. Um, where is the wind resource? I mean, the Great Plains is the best wind re land based wind resource in, in North America. It really has nothing to do with topography. It's just wide open spaces and weather systems moving across the, the, the continent. Mm -hmm. We suggest that when orographic wind is weak, they actually they're more in you know, risk of collision. But because orographic wind is actually declining when you go above the area, it will actually suggest that they might should actually go lower where, where there is an orographic wind versus thermal uplift, which can go up to 500 or even more meters above the ground. So maybe just when there is no none of both. They yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the point. So if, if there is available thermal uplift, they can seek that out and be easily above the turbines. It's particularly, I think, a problem on days when there, there isn't that option. So the birds have to get up and move and look for, for food. And they're using what's there. And if what's there is, is fairly marginal, they may be tempted to try and circle and circle and try to gain altitude and move. And that's, I think, when they're running into problems. It's, it's more, if there's thermal lift, generally they're able to get up above the turbine level fairly easily, I think. It's a combination of the lack of both. Yes, yes. Yeah. If there's strong enough orographic lift, yeah, but probably not by a lot. I mean, when you look at the, these tracks, they tend to be within that band of the, you know, the rotor swept. They're, they're not much higher than this. So how come the most probably lower is because of the height? Because there was, at least in that, at that wind farm, so he was asking how come the mortality was lower at, I'm sorry? Yes, in, in southern Spain. When yes. Well, that, that might be part of the issue. Yeah, the data is actually saying that they are, they are avoiding the avoiding the Let's see if I can get this real quick. Um, so the lift, if you look on the right, what lift is available, and it isn't much, is concentrated in these two areas for this particular wind speed, right? And this is the same area where the fatalities that, that we know about under which conditions they occurred are, are there. So there is some correspondence. In the case of E3, which is very close, the difference seems to be that there's widespread lift available nearby. So the birds don't have to go. In this case, I think the birds actually circle around and they go there because that's the only lift that's available. That seems to be the case. I don't know how universal this is, but definitely explains this information. Can you try 
meetings where workshops are actually circling around these areas, and maybe if you're playing it through, you expect more circles just around this idea, not so much in the vicinity, where in the other side you should have, you know, just put a point for each thermal that you identify. Of course, you don't have to do data on the thermal at least. Yeah, it's a good idea, and um, I don't have that data that my colleagues in Spain are. I think they have that data. They have a lot of uh, observational risk data um, on passes within 250. This is number of tr of tracks based on visual observation within 250 meters of the turbine, and how many of those are risky, which means they actually pass within 50 meters of the turbine. Um, and for those two areas, the, these are the highest percentages I know for anywhere in the site. But I'm not sure if they have information, uh, the kind of thermal information that you're talking about for the other regions here. Yeah, so it may not be a complete picture. Um, they, they do currently, so... Uh, damn. So this is kind of what the current configuration of that wind farm looks like, right? And so they actually have live people on the ground who are capable of shutting down a single wind turbine when there's a flock of storks that go through. The data, this data set was collected a few years back before each one of those little dots is a, is a turbine, a much smaller turbine. So this is an older data set before the repowering, which has helped reduce the number of kills, but it hasn't eliminated. Let's go and have lunch and we'll see you all back here at one. Enjoy.